Now, as I said earlier, today is what day? Palm okay, Palm Sunday. Now, we have the privilege as a church to have studied this passage not too long ago as we were in the passage of John, as we were coming to the end. And so often when I come to this holiday, this very special holy day, I come to it and I'm like, okay, Lord, how fresh is it in our mind? Should I spend this Sunday morning focusing upon it or do I remain in the text that we're at? And so I just kind of spent some time away uh, with the Lord this week and just really sought out what he wanted to do for us this week and next week. And the Lord began to share some amazing things for me that I want to share with you this morning that I think is powerful. You see, we have to recognize that what really we need to do, since we as a church are somewhat familiar with the story of Palm Sunday, God was saying to me, Waxer, what I want you to do is to lay out the entire Easter celebration, its remembrance for everyone to have our hearts prepared for what it's about that we're about to do. And this is the thing that I thought was so interesting. As God was laying on my heart saying, Wax, I want you to cover the entire Easter story on this Sunday, he shared a thought with me that I thought was very interesting and so did the first celebration. You know, when it comes to Christmas, we get a lot of people talking about, we get Christmas cards, we get things that talk about don't lose the meaning of Christmas and all the hustle and bustle. Don't get caught and all the commercialism and all this stuff that robs the story. And we see signs that say he is the reason for the season. Keep Jesus in the Christmas. We see all of that, right? Hello? Yes. Isn't it ironically that we don't get that about Easter? There doesn't seem to be this huge campaign amongst Christendom itself to say, hey, let's not get lost in all the hustle and bustle of Easter and miss the meaning and the things about bunnies and eggs and all these other different things that people tear away and they become a distraction. In fact, Easter seems to be a holiday that all of a sudden it's just here and the only thing you think about is what do I have to wear? And We've thrown out, I mean, things like Lent and other things that were whole time was focused on getting your mind ready, you know, we, because this is associated with this or that or that's Catholic or it's this or that. And so we, we get all these things aside and we forget and all of a sudden this beautiful, most critical and most important holy day of our lives and of all eternity just all of a sudden shows up. And the Lord says, that's not what I want of my people. And so what we need to recognize is that all the more this day, we would not have a Christmas without an Easter or an Easter without a Christmas, amen? Amen. And so we need this morning to focus on this. You see, it seems that this time has become more about spring break than it is about Jesus Christ. In fact, notice it's even called spring break, not Easter vacation. I went to Google pictures about this message, and so I Googled on Google Images, and I typed in the word Easter. This is the first page that came up. This is the second page that came up. I've yet to see anything that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you have to understand, and I've told this every single year to you because it's still amazing to me, but several years ago, my wife told me the story of two young girls that were in like a Long's drugstore card shop, and and as they're going through, the one girl pulls out a card, and on it was a cross all covered in flowers, and she said to the other girlfriend, she said, look, now they're even trying to put religion into Easter. (laughs) That's the world we're living in. And so, family, we need to recognize what is this beautiful time really all about. So, it is my hope and prayer this morning that on this Palm Sunday that I can prepare you for Meditation Monday. So that tomorrow you can take the notes of everything that we got and begin to say, okay, Lord, what is this all about? So that you will walk in the richness, the depth, the remembrance, the impact of what we are celebrating that started today and brings us all the way through. You will find it so much richer on Friday when you walk through these very stations after we have resonated with their truth and the biblical story behind it today. And that is the purpose that I want for us. And so that we will see these meanings, these incredible meanings in our lives and walk in truth. So are you guys ready? All right, well then let's start with today, and today is Palm Sunday, otherwise known as Triumphant Entry. And so would you now take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 21. Find me in Matthew chapter 21, and let's read what the scriptures say about Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. Matthew 21, verse 1. You there? Here we go. And when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethage, 
to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there to a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Now, you know how I love to make just fun of that. I mean, that's just so amazing. Go get a Mercedes, and if they say stop, just say, The Lord has need of it. You know what I mean? So that's the step of faith. And then he just says, hey, the Lord has need of Verse 4. Now this took place that was spoken through the prophet. It might be fulfilled, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your what? Your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. You see, the prophecy in the Old Testament even got the gender of what the, the, the donkey would be as he's coming in. Verse 6, and the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he sat. And most of the multitudes spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed afterwards were crying out, saying, notice, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, here is the story. Here comes Jesus riding in on the east gate, riding in on a donkey. Now, this was ludicrous to all the Roman soldiers as they're watching because any Roman would know anyone who was victorious would come riding on a horse, on a white horse. And yet, here comes this Jewish guy that they're making all this celebration about, and he's on a donkey, an instrument of peace rather than riding in as a conqueror. And yet the crowd then all of a sudden sees him, and then they begin to start grabbing branches and begin to start waving them in the sky. But it's just not a random branch. They begin to wave these palm branches. Why? Because palm branches were in fact the stars and stripes to the Jewish people. And it goes all the way back to the Maccabean revolt. They were on the Jewish coin. There were markings within the temple. And so here they see this Messiah. And so they begin to shave, I mean, I mean wave these branches in the air and scream and shout, Hosanna, literally means save now. Save us, Jesus. Save us, Messiah. Save us politically. Save us economically. Deliver us from this burden of Rome. And so there's this outcry as the people are shouting as Messiah enters in through the east gate, which was prophesied the day and the place where the Messiah would come. But there's another story going on at the same time. What a lot of folks don't recognize is that on this day on the Jewish calendar is known as the day of inspection. This was the day of the festival of Passover that as it is being kicked off on this day, it is known as the day of inspection or selection where every family was to bring their lamb to the high priest to inspect it, whether it was spotless, whether it was worthy for the sacrifice of Passover. And on this very day and on this very place, here comes Jesus riding in on a donkey. And the very first words that John the Baptist said of Jesus was what? Behold the the Lamb of God. As the world is shouting, save now. They're shouting here, save us economically, save us politically. Jesus, God is shouting a whole nother message. He's saying, here's my Lamb, inspect him. Amen. See if there's any fault in him. Behold the Lamb of God who is entering today to take the sins of the world. It was not a coincidence that this is coming on Passover. Passover, yeah. The celebration that the Jews have every year to remember how God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. And what happens? The angel of death comes by and kills any of the firstborn unless those who had the, the home that had the mark of the blood on the left and on the right and on the top and on the bottom. Symbolically thousands of years before making the sign of isn't it interesting that everyone that was inside those homes, they were not perfect. They were not any better than the people on the outside who did not. The only difference between them was that they had the blood of the lamb covering them. That was Passover. And here comes Jesus on this day. While the crowd is shouting one thing, God was shouting another. I wonder what you've been shouting. You see, what's so amazing is the crowd says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They say, Hosanna, save now, in the highest. And yet this same crowd, five days later, is screaming, crucify him, crucify him. 
so radically changed from praise that now they are seeking his death, a brutal death. The question has to be asked, how? How can this be? How can you go from Hosanna, save now, to five days later, kill the bugger. Get him out of my face. The answer, if you're taking notes, is this. Shallow praise. Shallow praise. You see, praise that is shallow will deflate. Let me say that again. Any praise that is shallow will deflate. You see, when you are asking of God for God to do something for you, when you come to God and say, Hosanna in the highest, Lord God, you know, fix my marriage, help my finances. Oh God, I need such and such here. And we come to God for what we think he needs to do for us. Beloved, that is shallow praise. You come to God not for what he can do for you. You come to God for who he is. Amen. He is God. You're not. Deal with it. He is the savior of the world. He is the perfect incarnate one who came and gave and offered his life. He became a human being. It's not what he needs to do. Family, he's already done for you and I more than I could ever need. Amen. More than I could ever deserve. Amen. Amen. He has died on a cross. And you see, when you have shallow praise, you start throwing out expectations of what God is supposed to do for you, then guess what? You too will find yourself turning your back on him because, hey, look, I'm 30 and I'm still single. What up, God? I got this going on. You haven't done this. You promised this. Hey, my grandmother died and we prayed and someone prophesied and said she would be healed but now she's dead. What up, God? And we start running through all these things because what we have is shallow praise. And my question this morning is how about yours? How about mine? Is your praise feeble? Do we stand here and shout and, and exclaim and say, Hosanna, Hosanna, but in reality, we come with not a depth of recognizing what he has already done are you hopelessly, emphatically, unashamedly, unapologetically in love with God? Because he is with you. He is with you. He has never given up on you. One of my favorite lines in a movie is in the Count of Monte Cristo when the priest reveals to him God's purpose for him. The Count says, I don't believe in God. And I love it. The priest says, that's okay. He believes in you. Amen. He believes in you. God believes in you. So much so that he rode in on a donkey to show the world peace is the path to righteousness. His peace, the man of peace. It's through Jesus Christ. And so here's what we need to understand this morning. What we need to recognize is this. This is powerful for us to understand. Is if your praise is fable, if you have found that you are dealing with pain and hurt and heartache, please jot this down. It's critical to understand. Giving God glory is the pathway to deliverance. I'm going to say it again. Giving God glory is the pathway to deliverance. You see, I'm going to tell you straight up right now. Everybody look at me this way for a sec. You can only do one of two things at the same time here. You can either grumble or praise. Amen. You can start thinking about what's going wrong in your life or you can start thinking about how blessed I am. Right. People now, you know, because so many care and they're asking me how I'm doing, they'll say, but, you know, I've just learned, you know what, I'm not even going there. I'm just talking about this. What God has done, I've just gotten tired of talking about being tired. I just want to talk about what God is doing. And focus on that. Giving God glory is the pathway. Family, in order to protect ourselves from robbing God and turning our back on God, this truly this morning, at the time of reflection afterwards, give God glory and praise for great things he has done above and beyond what any of us imagine, ask, or deserve. Amen? Amen. All right, now let's go to the Last Supper. As he now comes into the city, of course, all these expectations upon him, and he goes throughout the week doing things that blew minds, like turning over tables. But now we find ourselves at what's known as the Last Supper. It was the Seder, the Passover meal together. In the same miracle as the donkey, he said, hey, you will find a room and this and that, and that's exactly how they found it. But I want you to keep your finger here in Matthew because we're going to return to it. But join me at John 13. John chapter 13, verse 1, in this upper room. 
He says this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's just there to the right, a few pages, says this now. Now before the feast of the Passover, there it is mentioned, Jesus knowing that his hour, please note that, had come that he should depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the, what's it say? Man. That verse alone ought to be imprinted upon your heart and your mind and your lives. When you recognize on Passover, when the lamb was shed, the blood of the lamb was shed to protect those who were guilty in other sin, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he was going to depart and return to the Father, what does it say? He loved his own, and how long did he love him to the what? How long is Jesus going to love you? Amen. Amen. To the end. And he loves them to the very end. And the supper, excuse, verse 2, and during the supper, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and he was going back to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself about and he poured the water in the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel, which he he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. But Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head, my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and reclined at the table again. He said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Look at verse 15. For I gave you a what? If that is not highlighted in your Bible, may I suggest it becomes so. I gave you not a moment, not a wow, not an awe. God says, I gave you followers, I gave you disciples an example. And he says it very clearly. How I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Then he says it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is the one who sent him greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you... And what's that last part? Hmm. If you know these things, you are blessed because you know them. Is that what it says? If you know these things, then you are blessed if you, if you do them. See, here is the God of the universe, God incarnate. And as we know in Philippians, it tells us that he emptied himself of all of that which was in his divinity up there in heaven and all of his omniscience. And, and he humbled himself, putting on the limitations of a human being as he emptied and became all God and all man. So he humbled himself. Here again, now physically, he removes the robe, which is the rabbi robe, which is all the prestige. If there was anyone in that room who was to be looked at and to be revered, it was the rabbi, the teacher. He says, you call me teacher and rabbi. It's true. It's what I am. But he set aside that which was his right, his claim, and he humbled himself and he washed their feet, every one of their feet. And he says to Peter, every one's feet need to be washed as part as I serve you, for as I serve you, that's what makes you part with me. And this is what he does at this meal as he prepares this time for them. They're all in awe because they walked in and said, hey, there's no servant in here to clean our feet. Jesus showed them who the servant was and then called them to who the servants need to be. Now go back with me now to Matthew chapter 26 and let's continue on in this room. After washing their feet, then in Matthew 26, 26, they sit down and begin their meal. And it says this in Matthew 26, 26. And while they were eating... Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body. And when you had given the cup, 
And given thanks, he said to them, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Note that, underline that, highlight that. This cup is my blood, and it's for many. And what's it for? It's for forgiveness of sins. That's what my blood will be shed for. This is what he's calling them to understand this. And he goes on, verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. I love it. Jesus is saying, hey guys, there's a party. You're not going to be sharing this meal with me anymore, but we're going to share it together in heaven. That's one party I am not planning to miss. And he has given me a reservation, and I plan to be there. And I'm stoked about that. Verse 30, and after singing a hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, notice he says that and just goes woof, right over their head. And after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. I, I, I just see him just in the full Peter pan. <laughs> even though others may fall away. Oh, I'm sure his voice got lowered. I will never fall away from you. I will never deny you. You know, he just calls and he says, like, no, this would never happen. I will never fall away. Verse 34, Jesus says to him, truly, I say to you this very night, before a cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter says to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. Interesting. As we look at the story and what we recognize is going on in this upper room as they're celebrating the Passover, we recognize as Jesus is sharing with them, he does something very unique that so often you and I miss because as Gentiles not knowing Jewish custom, here they are sharing the Haggadah, which has been written and practiced for thousands of years already. And as they are in this Passover Seder, Jesus does something very different. He goes from the Haggadah, from the Passover Seder book of order, into a whole nother celebration, a whole nother festivity, festivity that every Jewish male in that room recognized but never shared at that moment. You see, what happened is when Jesus says, this cup is my cup, and he offers it to him, he says, take and drink, what we miss is that that was the way in which a Jewish male would ask a Jewish female to marry them. You see, once the fathers would agree upon a bride price, then a bottle of wine would be given from the bride's father to the groom's father, who would then take it, pour it in a glass, and then the groom would take that, and he would go to the young lass, and he would say, this is my cup. Take and drink, saying, this is my life. I offer you my life. And then she would take of it and drink of it and say, I receive your life, and I give you mine. And that's the ceremony that would take place. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of this, pass over, death passing over, the angel of those who had the blood of the lamb. Jesus says, hey, by the way, guys, will you marry me? Will you understand that I am going to be the groom and you, the church, are going to be the bride? And in the same intimacy that a husband and wife is, that is what is going to be required of you and I. For this hostile world is going to come against you, but I will never leave you. I will be there with you. And so in this moment, in this celebration, he has washed them, he has served them, and now he has offered himself to them. And all of a sudden, the only thing that begins to throw back is Peter professing his undying devotion for God. And it says the rest of the disciples did as well. Well, a couple of insights I want you to take down on your notes as you reflect this week. Number one, notice this meal was shared with just a precious few, just the twelve. As we look at this year, as God has called us to really focus on discipleship, recognize that what Jesus is showing me, that it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Jesus poured his life. He invested in these 12, for he knew the world was going to be turned upside right by these men as he poured into them, and not even just the 12, but even the three within them. we got Peter, James, and John. And people often wonder, why did these guys get a special treatment? Why do they often get a chance to go aside? 
Because of the calling that God had upon them, there needed to be some special pouring. James was the first one to die for the faith. John, the last one, watched all of his beloveds pass away. And Peter, God used Peter from being a big mouth to being the mouth of the Lord. And being able to be that man who preached the sermon. Remember, it was Peter who preached when the day of Pentecost fell. And 3,000 people got saved. God was pouring into these precious men. It's critical that you and I recognize our investment in the kingdom is not just about quantity, but quality. The next thing we need to recognize is what my Lord and Savior shows and reveals to me is that service, humility, it is more caught than taught. You see, Jesus modeled before them what it means to love on and to serve them. And as he washed their feet, he says, hey, I've done this as an example. He set everyone, including Judas, those whom he knew who would betray him, instead of judging upon them, he extends the love of the Father. What do you and I do? You see, this holiday reminds me of the power of God that the world is upside down. That God's kingdom is different than this earthly kingdom. And what I find here in this last part of the story is passion. Peter announces passionately, I will never deny you. And then he says, even if I have to die, I'm sure there was veins in his neck as he passionately said, even if I have to die, I will not deny you. And yet we know a few hours later, he is saying, I blankety blank, don't even blankety blank know this guy you're talking about. You see, how... Did this happen? Well, as I told you, first of all, shallow praise will become deflated. But the same is true with passion. Family, listen to me. Passion is not agape. Passion is not agape. Today, you could be passionate about the Lord, and I'll tell you what, if at all you have is passion, then the next temptation will come by and you'll be just as passionate about that. Passion is is of an emotive response. Agape is a factual response. God loves you just because. So much so that then when Jesus sees Peter afterwards and he's restoring him, he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I brotherly love. No, no, Peter, do you agape me? Father, I, I, I phileo you. No, Pete, do you agape me? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I could have sworn that I had unconditional love, but unconditional love is not found in me. The only way you and I can even love God unconditionally is by receiving his unconditional love. And so Peter was recognizing Jesus, you alone are the source of such love. And so when I come to this time, this upper room, God reveals reveals to me, Waxer, serve, share, humble yourself for recognizing even your passion and your own right can be robbed. But unconditional love from me, no man can take away. Amen? Amen. Now let's move to the garden. The scriptures say, after they sung a hymn, and they went out and they went to a garden. Find me now in chapter 26, starting at verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him, note as I just said, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father... If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep and watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter in temptation, for the Spirit is willing. But what's it say? Flesh is weak. Family, do not miss this, and I'll go over this more in a moment. But Jesus' prayer for them was not, you need to be praying for me. He was saying, you need to pray for you. This prayer that you need to be praying is because the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He says, listen, so that you may not enter in temptation. He's already told with Peter what the night unfolds. 
He knows what's about to go down. He's praying to the Father. He's saying, you need to be in prayer. That is what's going to deliver you instead of sleeping. And then he says, keep watch and praying that you may not enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed, my Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again, and he went away, and he prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up and accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders and the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign and say, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew out a sword, and he struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen this way? And at the time, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple and teach, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the Scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then, what's it say? All the disciples, what's it say? Left him and fled. Would you underline that? Then all of the disciples left him and fled. Here we see Jesus going off to pray. And what he finds is is that he knows what's about to take place. He's going to have himself prepared before that which is about to go. And so my Lord gives me the example of prayer. Before you go out to battle, you stop, drop, and pray. You get on your knees and pray. He's taking his cares and burdens to the Father. And he asks his friends to pray with him. And what does he find them doing? Sleeping. Three times he comes back. And what are they doing? Sleeping. Okay, now let's cut them a little bit of slack because they've had four glasses of wine and a full Seder meal. Now, in the Seder, you're supposed to just take a sip anyways and not drink the whole thing, so shame on you. But nonetheless, these guys have had their fill, and so physiologically, they're down for the count. And Jesus finds them sleeping. But we need to understand something that's very important. Spiritual fitness is much like physical fitness. Just jot that down. Spiritual fitness, believe it or not, is just like physical fitness. You see, you need to recognize that when you need the strength, you need to build up beforehand. I can't just say tomorrow, hey, I want to run a marathon and go do 26 miles. No, I first need to figure out how to run one mile. And then after the one mile, then you try to do the three, and then you try to do the five, and so forth. And you build yourself up. And so when you are trying to do physical fitness, the one thing that is crucial is consistency. Anyone here recognize that when you are trying to remain healthy and working out that you need to go consistently over and over and even though you've done three months, you can miss three weeks and you're already back to the beginning again? Anyone know what I'm talking about? It's amazing how quick we can atrophy. You see, folks, here's the deal. Why were the disciples not able to pray and watch with Jesus for an hour? Because they weren't in the habit of doing so. This was not yet part of their pattern. Oh, it will be, and we'll find that out for sure. But we recognize that right now, this had not been their pattern to spend time alone in prayer. Not so with Jesus. You see, Jesus, we find over and over in the scriptures, he went off by himself to pray. He went solo. We'll see time after time, and coming down from the mountain after prayer, spending a whole night in prayer. You see, Jesus interceded and brought his heart before the throne of God so that he and the Father were in tune, listen, so that when his hour would come, he would have the strength to endure. 
See, family, you don't know your hour. You don't know when that phone is going to ring. I got a phone call yesterday from a precious family in our church and said, please pray, our baby has stopped breathing. That was an hour. You don't know the hour in your life. And you see, the time is now to prepare ourselves to become physically, spiritually strong in the Lord. To trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. But the problem is, so many are so anemic because their prayer life is so before the meal, at the end of the meal, before the devotion time, and that's all we got. So we, again, what we have is a whole generation of supermodel Christians. <laughs> Absolutely anemic because we have not been buffed out in prayer and spiritual disciplines. Listen, I don't want supermodels. I want Arnold Christians. Buff, because we've learned to cast our cares to the Lord 24-7. Amen? So we recognize these disciples that they, they missed the whole thing. Why? Because they themselves were not built up and their own spiritual strength was not there in the time of need. Listen, I don't know when your hour will be, but I'll tell you right now. Through triumph, through tough times, through good times, through victories, through defeats, pray. Pray at all times. And trust me, anyone can pray. <laughs> if he can pray, so can you. And so, what we need to learn now in our lives is how do we grow in our spiritual strength and in our trust in the Lord that our praise is not shallow and empty, that it's not just response-oriented. The answer will be found on your knees in prayer. This is what Jesus has called you and I to do, to pray. Now, let's go to the next place. After Jesus is now arrested in the garden, he's taken to Caiaphas' home. And so we find the scene now in the courtyard outside of his home, and that is Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. Matthew 26, 57. Join me now as we follow Jesus into the courtyard. It says, and those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter also was following him, what's it say? At a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And he entered in and he sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now drop to verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a certain servant girl came to him and said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. Verse 71, And when he had gone out into the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, the bystander came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear. On my mother's grave, blankety blank, I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which he had said, before a cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out, and what does it say he did? He wept bitterly. Here Peter goes from Peter Pan to Peter Flub, Peter Fail. How did that happen, Pete? Well, we've looked at that study many times of the five steps to pain, but his overconfidence in the flesh, I won't deny you, sleeping instead of praying, devotion, no, action, He's running around taking the sword and trying to cut off ears. He's trying to take things in his own hands. Then he starts following Jesus at a distance, and then he finds himself at the enemy's fire. And these steps go one after another. But as I mentioned before, the problem here is that Peter, at this point, is still walking in passion. And he found that what he was passionate most about at that moment was his own life, his own skin his own job, his own reputation, his own salary, his own mortgage, whatever it was, it was there in the fact that he said, I will not take the stand for Jesus. The cost is too high. But here's the thing that's amazing. Jesus knew. Jesus knew exactly what Peter was going to do. Who told Peter? 
Understand, Jesus is the one that told Peter, so understand with me clearly that Peter failed, yes, but he did not fail the Lord. God is the one who knew what he would do, and yet God chose him from the foundations of the earth, and he said all the way back in Matthew 16, hey, Peter, upon that profession that you said that I am the Savior, that I am the rock, that I am the only way to heaven, he says, I'm gonna build my church on that profession, and I'm gonna use you. You see, Jeremiah 29, 11, God had plans to prosper, not to harm for a future and hope. God chose the guy who he knew would fail him in this hour. Welcome to life. God has chosen you knowing that there are going to be times that you are going to fail. But as the line goes, you're never going to let God down because you've never been holding him up. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. He is omniscient. Does it break his heart? Yes, because he knows the pain you will go through and others who will be hurt by it. But it does not catch him by surprise. Family, that's why he came. He came because all we, like sheep, have gone astray. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. And so when I was like going, Lord, why do you call me to be a pastor? That's the craziest thing. Why would you call me to be a pastor? And then I saw the scripture. He chose the foolish to confound the wise. (laughs) And I said, then I'm your man. (laughs) You see, God knows. And so family, I want to tell you right now, it's foolish. It's foolish for you and I to think that at some point in our life, we will not fail. That's what I love about this photo is that here we see the courtyard of Jesus, I mean of Caiaphas, and there's Jesus, but it, it puts a man of modernity, recognizing that there's a time in our lives that every one of us is going to reach out for our own skin rather than for the cross. And God says, yeah, I know. That's why I came. I forgave you for that too, so just ask me. Just ask me. I made provision on the cross knowing that you too would deny me. Some of you said, I, I, I've never denied him. Well, when there was that opportunity at work and the joke started going around and someone started saying something about something that was contrary to the word, will, and way of God, did you remain silent? When the Holy Spirit was prompting you and saying, hey, here's an opportunity to say, you know what, I don't see it that way. In fact, as a Christian, one of the things that the Lord has challenged my heart is dot, dot, dot. Or as everyone's blasting Ted at the water cooler, do you just jump right in and blast Ted? Or do you say, you know what, we don't know everything that's going on in Ted's life. I don't know what's there. I mean, I, heck, I know I'm not perfect. You see, do we live the power of the cross? Do we live in recognizing that Jesus said, wash one another's feet, including Judas? Do we live an attitude of servitude because he's already blessed us beyond what we can ask or imagine? You see, he knows your limitations. He knows my limitations. And here's the beautiful thing. He uses them to build me up. And so every time I struggle and fall, God begins to pour into me those very things so that I will recognize all the more I need his work in my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul put it this way, verse 9. He says, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for power is perfected, where? In weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Wow. He's saying, listen, it's where you are weak then we are strong because where you recognize your weakness, that's when you cry out to me. Some of you right now, you might be saying as a single person, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm saving myself for marriage. Man, it ain't gonna happen. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're going down. But if you're gonna say, you know what? I recognize that anything is possible. I am a vulnerable person. I'm a flesh monger like everybody else. Lord Jesus, without your help, I'm in trouble. That's a prayer he'll answer. See, where you think you're strong, you're not putting the fortification. If you recognize you are weak, then you're saying, God, I am so vulnerable. Lord Jesus, I need your protection, period. Amen? Amen. Now, there's a comedian that I love, Tim Hawkins. He's just hysterical, and he gets me laughing. He says, you know, one of the funniest things is, he says, when I go and I preach someplace, and the guy prays over me, he says, Lord, I just pray a hedge of protection over Tim. He says, really, a hedge? That's all you could do? (laughs) Like Satan's were like, oh, bushes, scary. It's like, hey, listen, I don't want a hedge. I want the full armored walls and the barbed wire. 
I want God to surround me, not just a bunch of bushes. Amen? And so here we are. We're saying, okay, Lord, I need to recognize, as Peter recognized, Jesus said, watch and pray. You know why? Because there's temptation around you, Pete. Waxer, you need to watch and pray. Why? Because there's temptation around you. And temptations of all kinds, which we're going to see even further in a moment. But family, recognize this. This Peter, this Peter, I don't even blankety-blank know the guy, is the one on the day of Pentecost who preached the sermon and 3,000 got saved. God sees who you will be as well as who you are. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's move on to the trial. And so we've seen the outside. Now what's going on on the inside? Matthew 26, verse 59. Matthew 26, verse 59, it says this. Now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. And they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated that I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Verse 63. But Jesus, what's it say? Underline that, please. Highlight that. Jesus kept silent. All kinds of ridiculous lies are being said about him, and Jesus remained silent. Now, follow with me here. And the high priest, verse 63, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> now he speaks. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I'll tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and he yelled, Blasphemy! He is blasphemed! What further need we have witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Now, as we recognize this scene, we see some very interesting things. Here is Jesus, and they're trying to come up with some kind of charge because he was sinless, and so they had to go to falsities to try to attack him. But what does my Lord do? He remains silent against all of these falsities and all these charges against him. I want you to jot this down and meditate on this with me during this week. Silence is not necessarily a sign of strength, but silencing yourself is understand that. Silence is not necessarily the sign of strength, but silencing yourself is. As I mentioned, some of you, you have been silent, not out of strength, but out of cowardice. You were more concerned what the others in the room might think of you rather than what Jesus thought of them to speak through you. And so often we have been silent because it's not a strength, but actually a weakness. But oh, when there's an opportunity to speak and the Holy Spirit says, do not. Oh, that is a sign of strength. You see, when falsely accused, our natural desire, our natural tendency is to defend ourselves. And people start saying stuff, and then we come back with, oh, no, that's not true, and this and this. And so then we write an email, and we CC it to all these people so they can see what's going on and all this stuff, and we spend a national pastime defending ourselves of the ugliness that's said, and we slander out other, uh, other uglinesses, and things go back and forth all the time. What did my Lord and Savior model for me? He modeled for me that do not waste the spiritual time or energy battling with nonsense. Amen. He is dealing with the Scripture right here. I can show you verse after verse in the Proverbs, but notice just this one. Look overhead, Proverbs 9, 7. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself, and he who reproves a wicked man gets insults. For him, do not reprove a scoffer, lest he hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. The Bible says, "Acknowledge a fool," or I mean, speak to a fool, respond to a fool, and you will acknowledge him. See, the Bible is saying that there's folks who are so weak, so insecure that they need to lash out at others. The problem isn't necessarily you; it is their need to validate themselves. And so, by mocking and bringing others down, there's a sense of value found. And the Bible says, "Don't feed that." Ecclesiastes says, hey, there's a time to speak and a time to remain silent. Some people might need to recognize that passage. 
You see, the Lord Jesus showed me that, Waxer, my energies, your energies, are they going to be running around trying to defend ourselves, or are we going to be standing up for the cause in the name of Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. Folks, there are always going to be somebody saying something about you, and the enemy loves it because he wants you to get distracted caring about you rather than caring about the call. There are going to be people who are going to say things about you on the net, so on and so forth, whatever it is, and you can spend all your time running around and playing their game to validate you, or you can remain focused to the call. Jesus remained focused to the call. Listen, I hope nobody in here, if, if you have a chihuahua in this room, I apologize. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah? I'm sorry. <laughs> but what I have noticed most often about chihuahuas, especially when in my neighborhood, is they just... <laughs> It seems like the smaller they are, the more they bark. <laughs> and they just... <laughs> okay. I have a pit bull. I walk Hayden by, and this little chihuahua comes and goes... <laughs> and you know what Hayden does? She sits and looks at it and goes, really? <laughs> she looks up at me and looks at me and then just... <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, oh, would I love to let her go. Would Hayden like a snack, huh? Want a snack, baby? You know, I mean, literally, you know the way that those jaws open. When she goes to lick me, it's like a cobra. It's like that big. I mean, he would be, chomp, no chihuahua. She does not spend her energy getting, oh, oh, oh. she's like, really? Let's go. And just walks away. Some of you here today, you need to learn the lesson that the dogs have already learned. The chihuahuas are going to bark. Listen. The dog will howl at the moon, but the moon just keeps shining. You keep shining. Amen. Keep shining for Jesus. Am I saying that you have just a right to be a jerk and not respond to accountability? That's not what I'm saying, and that's not the message here. The point is, is that you know those who love you and those who are around you. It's those who speak truth and love to you. Respond to them. Have your safe, your scheduled time, your accountability, your fear of the Lord, and your encourage of others. But listen, let's not spend our time in the meaningless. Amen? The Bible is clear for you and I. Listen, the way up is the way down. It's about humility. It's about character. Humble yourselves. Don't be worried about trying to defend yourselves, what others are thinking about you. Know what God knows about you, and that's what matters. Now let's move to the cross. The cross. After this, they take Jesus to the cross, and I want you to remember something about that, is that Jesus was not just falsely charged. He was also wrongly treated. Recognize that in the beatings that Jesus took, before he goes to the cross, these beatings were that you and I would see what humanity is capable of. This is what we do to one another. This is when our tongue lashes out at others. And, and as we, we strike back, and Jesus says, this is what sin looks like. Falsely charged, falsely accused, and falsely treated. But nonetheless, Jesus had a bigger picture in mind. That which is on the cross, find me now at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, find me at verse 35. And when they had crucified him... They divided up, notice this, they divided up his garments. After they hung him up there, put him up in the sky, they started gambling for his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And they put up above his head a sign, a charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him. Still happening. Still at this point. He's being wrongly accused, hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priest also along with the scribes and the elders were mocking him and saying, ha, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we shall believe in him. He trusts in God, let him, meaning God, deliver him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were also been crucified with him were casting the same insult at him. Now from the sixth hour, Darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he quotes Psalm 22. And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, and he put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let's see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, 
and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split and the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, meaning were dead, were raised. And coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, he entered the, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened, duh, and said, Truly, this was what? This was the Son of God. Now, we have this account here of Jesus on the cross, giving his life up for you and for me. But something happened. When it says there that Jesus spoke with a loud voice, what did he say? We know from the other Gospels it is tetelestai. What he is saying is mission accomplished. What? The guy is sitting there dying on a cross between two thieves, and what is he saying? Hey, paid in full. It is finished. Amen. The mission is accomplished. It's finished. There I am, and I died on the cross for the sins of the world. And so here, what looks like chaos, what looks like anarchy, what looks like evil winning was very much the plan of God. You see, you and I have a mission. We do. Jesus said, mission accomplished. Will I be able to look my Lord in the eye and say, mission accomplished? What is my mission? Well, look to the very next chapter, chapter 28. Look to the very end of the chapter. Look at verse 19. It says this, go therefore to church and laugh and go home and have lunch. <laughs> no? Go therefore and what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. We're going to do that again next week in the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, not suggested, commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, Wax, here's your mission. It is to bring the message of what I have done for humanity and bring it to a hungry, thirsting, and lost world. But you see, if you remember the movie Saving Private Ryan, in the movie you recognize after this incredible scene in Normandy and all the battle that goes on, there are three brothers that are killed and there's one more that's left. His name was Ryan. And the army says, hey, this brother needs to go home. And so he commissions Tom Hanks, I'm just going to call him Captain Hanks because I don't remember his name, and says, okay, you guys need to go find Private Ryan. And if you know the story, after being shot at and their lives risked, one of them says, hey, what's so special about this Ryan guy? Why do we have to risk our lives and put our lives? And so the byproduct of not knowing what was going on and why became confusion and anger and frustration. And then it took Captain Hanks to then look at him and says, guys, it's not about Ryan. It's about fulfilling the mission. Why we are here is because we believe not in anarchy, but in a law and order and a respect for one another. And so there is a bigger picture. There is you and I standing up for what we believe in, and that is following order and caring for one another. And so what he began to say is, guys, there's a bigger picture here than you and I. And you see, when you and I just look at, well, what's the point of remaining celibate? Why should I do that? Or why should I give my money for this? Or why should I surrender this to the Lord? And when you start looking at the Ryan, you're going to find yourself grumbled. Oh, family of God, please understand there's a huge picture picture. And you and I are just a beautiful piece of the tapestry. And God is using you to paint a picture to a hungry and thirsty world. We have a mission. And my Lord said, I have finished my mission. And then he commissioned you and I. And you see what it is? It's simply this. As it was with those soldiers, it is with you and I. The message is, it's about your devotion, not just your devotions. It's not, hey, I'm glad you spent 15 minutes, 15 minutes with me in the morning and you jotted down in your journal. That's great. But what God is saying is what really matters is what happens when you close the book. And then when you go out the door, that's the mission. Are you giving him your devotion? You see, Jesus came to save the world. Our job is to carry out that message of his mission. And here's the irony. The irony is, is that it's already been paid for. It's already accomplished. He already set it on the cross. But it's whether or not we want it and then getting the rest of the world to want it. That's the irony. Do you today want everything that God has in store for you? And before you start saying yes, ask yourself, have I surrendered all? 
It's not I surrender one-tenth, but I surrender all. And you see, God has this incredible big picture life for you and I. And so as he's offering this out, the question is, are you and I wanting it? But sadly, there's a world out there that's just like these soldiers. You see, these soldiers are gambling at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because they were taking care of their own needs. They were so concerned about making sure I get this kind of money so that I can have this kind of car so that I can get my kids in this private school because i got to look like a good parent, like I care, because people will judge me if I don't put my kids in this kind of school. And so they were spending all their energy taking care of their own needs right under the feet of Jesus. Amen. And you and I do that every day. You see, instead of looking down, what would happen if we just looked up and saw the cross and saw love look like this. Love, love, love. I love you unconditionally. And this is how much he reached out his arms and died. Why are we running around like these guys? Hey, I want the gown, I want the cloak, I want this. Why are we spending our energy on what's better for me when I understand the one that is better for me is right above those men, and that is Jesus Christ. I surrender all. You see, the question this morning is this. Will you complete your mission? Jeremiah 29, he says, I have a plan for you, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. Your mission is different than mine. Will you complete it? I want to hear the Lord say to me, and I want to hear him say to you, well done, not well started, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's now go to the best part of the whole story, the resurrection. The resurrection. Find me now at Matthew 28, verse 1. Amen. You ready for this? 28, 1. Now, after the Sabbath... As it has begun to dawn towards the first day of the week, that's meaning Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his garment was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who, notice, has been crucified. Verse 6, best line in all of text in humanity. He is not here, for he has risen. Amen? Amen. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. It's almost as if he's saying, hello. You know, just as he said, hello. Remember when he said, raise up, hello. But the angels aren't like me. Okay, anyways. So... Just as he said. Then he goes on to say this. It's so amazing. Come, see the place where he was lying. Hey, don't just take my word for it. Take a peek. And now notice, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Wow. Do you recognize with me that the first message that they were told is that he's not here, he's alive, and he's risen. And then the second thing he said is now sit down and journal and just meditate in your living room about how wonderful that is. What does he tell the ladies to do next? Hmm, That's twice we get the go word. Go, tell anyone that you love. Go tell those disciples, go tell those folks that he is not here, that he is risen. Oh, by the way, how can you do that? Oh, because you're going to look and see yourself that he's not in here. See, beloved, have you seen that he is alive? Have you seen him? Do you know that you know, regardless of who wants to put whatever argument in front of you, that he is not here, he is alive, and that he is risen and he has paid the price for your sin? Oh, then it's ready to go time. It's go time. Amen. And he's saying, Go. Tell them what incredible things the Lord has done. Now, here's the thing that's so amazing. Jesus is on the cross, and what is he saying? Accomplished. Mission accomplished. Now, is that what the disciples are saying? Uh Uh-uh. Accomplished is the last thing in their mind. They're looking up at their Savior. They're looking at their friend, their Messiah, and they're like, what's going on? His ministry, his life cut off, cut short abused. They're completely, it's ruined. They ruined it. Somebody made a mistake. Was I mistaken? You see, they're completely confused. Why? Well, Jesus was dead. 
Because he was dead, they're hiding in a room completely. Their heart was not mission accomplished. It's mission failure, mission meltdown. Because Jesus is dead, and well, dead messiahs don't do anything. Or do they? Especially when that was the plan from all along. Amen? Look overhead, Christian. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates. He don't talk story. He demonstrates his own love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? That was the plan. That was the purpose all along. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. What? According to the Scriptures. It was prophesied that the Messiah would come and die for us and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Again, according to the Scriptures. See, the thing that's so cool is this. Who knew? Who knew that death wasn't the end? Well, God did. But you see, to us, death is death, end is end. Isn't it great to know that God's ways are not our ways? You know, some of the best things that have happened in my life were some of the worst things that happened in my life. Getting kicked out of this, getting rejected from that, not allowed in this. Oh, Lord, why? He had something so much better than my vision so much better than what I knew and could understand. You see, his ways are not our ways. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to wrestle with this, but it is true as the day is long. Predictable is not a word that I would use to describe God. Okay? Faithful, yes. Dependable, reliable, but not predictable. Now, the secular would say, wait a minute, that can't be reliable, faithful, but not predictable. It must be. No, 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 no. My God is large and and, and the way up is the way down. Humble yourself and I will exalt you. Say, what? That's not what Madison Avenue is preaching, but that's what Jesus preached. You see, the thing is this. When we recognize the Holy Spirit focuses on the unseen and we always just focus on the seen, we need to step back and say, God, we know that you have a plan to prosper, not to harm. So regardless of my layoff, regardless of my family's struggle right now, regardless of whatever cancer or thing I'm dealing with, regardless of what I see, feel, and know, you are the author and the finisher of all and everything good. And that God says, hallelujah, and God says, I will turn all things to good to those who love me and are called according to my purpose. Amen? Amen. That is the Bible. You see, when we focus only on the natural things, family, I'm going to tell you right now, you expect too little from God. Hey, miracles are what he does. It's on his business card. (laughs) Jesus Christ, man of miracles. It's what he does. You need a miracle, go to Jesus. At every single wedding that I do, I pray, Lord, as you were there at the wedding of Cana, I ask you not only to be in this wedding, but be in this marriage. And when they need a miracle, Lord, I pray they will go to you as well. For you who turn the water into wine will do whatever is necessary if they turn to you, the author and the finisher. That is God's call for you and for me. You see, we have to understand that as Christians and a miracle-working God, you and I get to anticipate the awesome. When's the last time you anticipated the awesome? I'm going to tell you right now, students, my life changed when I recognized that God actually did go to high school. When I recognized that he was actually there and helping me through junior high, through high school, there was something that all of a sudden, God is here in this place. I began to expect the awesome. Woo-hoo! God is going to show up today. How? I don't know, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> you see, when you anticipate the awesome, when you think the unthinkable, that's what the Bible challenges you. Notice what it says in Ephesians 3.20. It says this, Now to him who is able to do far exceedingly above and beyond what you and I can ask or imagine according to the power that works within us. God is saying, I'm going to blow your mind. But are you going to open your mind to see it? How about this promise in Ephesians 1? It says this in verse 18 and 19, that he says that the resurrection gives us three things. The hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and the greatness of his power. Oh, I wish I had another hour to preach on that, and you're saying, please don't. (laughs) But today, understand, because of the cross, because of the resurrection today, are you walking around with the hope of his calling? Hey, death isn't death. End isn't end. God's ways are not our ways. Amen. I have hope beyond what I can see or feel. And why? Because I've been given the riches of his glory, and so I will give God glory back. I will worship and adore him for all that he has given unto me. And you know why I can do it? Because I have the strength from him. 
the riches of his power, the greatness of his power, that I can do all things through Christ. I want to say this and draw us to a close, and that's this. The miracle of the resurrection, family, the miracle of the resurrection can be experienced every single day. Not just in this week before Easter, every day. Listen, if Jesus has the power over sin and death, what can't he do? He is, again, large and? Okay, and so with him, what can't I do? See, you think, there, there's nothing that God can't do, and if I'm with him, and if I'm in his word will away, what, what can't we do? You see, the Bible says apart from him I can do nothing, but I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. My question is, is if you will begin to understand and meditate on what this week is in remembrance of, you and I will begin to live less confused, more exciting, big picture, purpose-given lives. Amen? How? Well, let me sum it up for you. This is how you and I can live such purpose-given, big picture, more exciting, less confused lives. What did we learn in the story this week? Number one, pray. Pray or be pray, Christian. Pray. Begin to build yourself up in buffness of casting your cares to the Lord, spending time with him, and you will find five minutes goes to 10, goes to 20, goes to 30. You will find an afternoon will go by as you spend the time with him. Secondly, the Lord showed me today, serve. Well, actually, get your nose out of your own drama and serve others. Wash others' feet. Don't try to critique whether they are worthy or not. That's not your kuleana. That's mine. Serve one another because all we like sheep have gone astray. Thirdly, we unite, you need to recognize that you and I, we've all betrayed him at some time. Our actions have cried out, crucify him. In the way in which we turned our back because of shallow praise, unmet expectations, whatever it would be in the area of silence, the Lord says, hey, I know. And that's the fourth thing. Recognize that he knew. He knows that I'm a work in process. Pray for me. I pray for you. We are works in process. We are going to make mistakes and stumble and fall. But Jesus knows that, and that's why you were on his mind when he went to the cross. And why did he go there, knowing that you and I would stumble and fall? He went because he says this, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Are you living in an abundant, spirit-filled life this morning? Because it's found when those who pray and those who serve and those who will humble themselves and recognize that forgiveness needs to come from God and at times even forgive yourself as God has said, listen, I have forgiven you. Why won't you forgive you? I knew that you would do this. That's why I went to the cross. Don't waste my pain and let you carry it. I carried it for you. That's what Jesus says. And then this last thing to remember is this. That empty tomb tells me that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Now I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. More than just a great song. It's what puts the smile on my face and allows me to deal with me. You think it's hard dealing with me. Huh, I got to deal with me. <laughs> I know what goes on up here. Scary. But when I understand his unconditional grace, his forgiveness, that he came knowing my sin, knowing my need, he paid the price, he showed the example of servitude and love. This morning, I want to ask the Christians in this room, let's learn it, know it, and let's live it. But this morning... If he is not living in you, if you have not surrendered and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, right now what you have is called a knowledge. It is a knowledge of, but you do not have the presence of God. He will not force himself upon you, but at the same time, he will only come into the life that has surrendered unto him. Jesus died on the cross, and you know what he wants from you? Everything. So I will not paint some picture and saying, hey, you want to have life that's cozy and your checkbook will always balance? Give your life to Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying Jesus knows in this world we have sin and death and separation and he came to die on the cross to pay for that. But most importantly, after that, he came that you might have fellowship with him. And so this morning, do you know his name? Do you know his face? Do you know his voice? Do you know the comfort of his presence with you so that in that hour, whenever that hour will be, you know that Jesus will be there because you and him are like this? He says today, I love you. Will you marry me? Heavenly Father, I thank you, my Lord and Savior, my God, my rock. 
You've shown us so much today, Lord, and as we come to reflection and remembrance, prepare our hearts for this week that you came in shouting one message and yet we were shouting another. Oh, Lord, how often do we miss what you are saying because we're too busy speaking. As the crowd was saying, Hosanna, you were saying, here is the Lamb. I will save you in ways you don't even know. And so, Lord, may our praise not be shallow. May it not be fallow, Lord God. I pray that it would be sincere and in-depth and remembrance of what you've done for us. That, Lord, we too would not walk away and, and begin to shout against you, but, Lord, we would give praise beyond what we can think, ask, feel, for our hope is in you, not in our feeling. It is the truth that has set us free. So, Lord, may we be worshipers in spirit and truth. Lord God, may we be the servants that you've called us and showed us and gave us the example that you, the teacher, laid aside your right, your privilege, your position, and served and washed one another. Help us, God, to do so. Lord, help us to recognize the privilege of prayer and fellowshipping with you, and yet at the same time what you would strengthen in our, in our trials that we might walk through this kingdom with you. From this land to the next, I thank you, Lord. But now, Lord Jesus, I pray for any who have said, today is the day that I want to ask you, Lord, to be my Lord and Savior. Today, I need to surrender. I need to start now with making this a relationship, not a religion, not a knowledge, not a mindset, but a relationship, a family. God, your love. If you're here this morning, I want to encourage you to pray with me. You can pray out loud. You can pray silently. It's not a magic prayer. It's an honest heart that will surrender yourself to allow God to come in and to be your Lord and Savior. If this is your heart, pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And today, Jesus... Please be my Lord and Savior. I believe today that you can save me. And I need your grace. Please give me today your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me to teach me what it means to live as a child of God. Today, Father, I come home. Father, we pray over these precious ones today that have joined us in the family of God. All we are sheep who are in process. But Lord, may we come alongside and stimulate one another towards love and good deeds and courage and disciple one another. Lord God, I pray that we would be the trophies, the testimonies of your grace as we give it, as we live it, and as we worship the giver of life and everlasting Jesus Christ. We worship you.